evolution, which I will explain to you, um, can act upon them. And I, that is why we have religions, and that is why religions have some of the properties, some desirable and some undesirable they do. Um, the outline of the talk, I just tell you, I'm going to briefly compare genetic and cultural evolution for those among you who perhaps are not evolutionary biologists or scientists. I will compare the control of group behavior in bees from that in humans because a lot of sociobiology and the speculation on this kind came from studies of bees and talk about the problems of group selection in general. I'll then talk about the role of religious prescriptions and finally, I shall talk about the implications of this for the rest of this meeting. Well, genetic evolution, evolution as first described, describes the processes by which all different life forms have developed from a single ancestor. I may say that is not a discovery of Darwin's. Lamarck already knew this, um, uh, and probably Darwin's grandfather, that we came from a common ancestor. We now believe these ancestors are the archaea, rather recently described microorganisms which are rather more like eukaryotes than ordinary bacteria, which seem to have separated very early. And these very early organisms were responsible for actually creating the first free oxygen, itself showing that there couldn't have been animals at that time because there was no oxygen for them to breathe. And interestingly enough, the archaea are still about three and a half billion years later, um, their descendants are still with us. And I'd like to give you a timeline because that's important. And if we uh, assume the universe is a year old for convenience. Um, the Earth is about four months old. The archaea appeared about 11 weeks ago. The last shared ancestor of men and chimpanzees occurred three and a half hours ago. Um, Homo sapiens sapiens, modern man, cro magnon man, appeared four minutes ago. And the agricultural revolution, which started civilization such as we know it, uh, occurred about 21 seconds ago. So it's all pretty recent. And there have only been, because man has a long generation time, about 4,000 generations of humans on average. It's worth pointing out that E. coli goes through that number of generations in about two months, and mice in about 650 years. And the behavior of E. coli and mice over these time scales hasn't actually changed at all. Um, uh, it's while well, man has gone in the last 10,000 years from the Stone Age to the Silicon Chip Age and has changed immensely in the way he lives his life. And the point of this is, uh, we'll come back to genetic evolution is actually quite slow. Um, Darwin's great discovery was natural selection. And natural selection favors the survival of those who leave the most progeny that will themselves reproduce. The last phrase is extremely important. It is naive students of evolution tell you that selection stops working at the end of reproductive life. That, of course, is completely untrue. It's no good leaving children who are going to starve to death. Um, uh, and humans are unique in the fact that about 25% of one's lifespan is spent dependent on one's parents, which is very unusual in man. And therefore, uh, evolutionary selection works much after the end of um, reproductive life. Second important point is natural selection can work only on pressures that exist at the present, cannot work on future, uh, it doesn't anticipate future events, and above all, it has no goal. Well, that is where Lamarck was so wrong and Darwin was right. Evolution doesn't lead anywhere in particular, it goes. It's also one reason, as I will come back to, that uh, projecting evolutionary speculation to the future even if John Harris does it, is an extremely dangerous thing to do because the future will surprise us all. Um, fourth important point here is the enormous importance of parasitism as a driver of natural selection, which is frequently underestimated. Example I always like to give is if you assume for a moment that HIV were to change so it could spread like flu and would really become a major pandemic, then the planet would probably be inhabited after a couple of generations by those rare mutants that don't have the receptors for HIV, that don't carry CD4 or CCR5. And there's no reason to believe they'd be particularly beautiful, particularly clever, particularly strong, or particularly moral, but they don't have receptors for a virus that kills everyone else. That is how evolution works. Now, oop, 
Now, this slide is not put in just for the benefit of John Salston. Um, it was already in the talk beforehand. Um, social Darwinism and this phrase, the survival of the fittest, which I agree entirely is an unfortunate term. It was actually coined by Herbert Spencer, a well-known 19th century philosopher, actually a bit older than Darwin. But both Darwin used it and Huxley, as I will show you later, most certainly used it. And its real problem is that it confuses competition with conflict. Um, uh, this is a confusion which had terrible political consequences, which was adopted both by Marx and by Hitler, who believed that su survival involved conflict between the fitter and the less fit, and there was some duty of those who considered themselves more fit to eradicate the, the less fit. And I would point out to you that this is actually quite uncommon in animal evolution. All the herbivores who live on the African plains do not try to eradicate each other. As a matter of fact, the carnivores don't even try to eradicate each other. Lions don't try to eradicate hunting dogs, or vice versa. Tigers actually like to have leopards about because they can steal their prey, but they don't try to exterminate them. And the idea, therefore, that competition um, always involves conflict is quite wrong. There's a rather pretty example here, um, which I won't go into, which is between the gray squirrels and the red squirrels, and people always thought the gray squirrels either killed the red squirrels or at least took their food, but actually that's all quite wrong. They both suffer from the squirrel pox virus. That kills the red squirrels, but the gray squirrels survive, and therefore where the two coexist, the red squirrels die of disease, which is um, a quite satisfying explanation. I now turn to cultural evolution, and culture used in this sense has a very specific meaning. It describes the transmission between uh, horizontally and vertically of information, particularly information about behavior between individuals and generations by any means other than through the genome. Um, cultural evolution has been described in animals um, and was transmitted originally entirely by example. Um, and as John Harris has already told you, um, uh, detailed cultural evolution is, is characteristic of humans and was hugely influenced by the development of language, um, and probably all humans had some form of language. But the oral transmission about 200 generations ago, which is only 5% of human development, uh, was enormously changed again by the development of writing so that information could be stored permanently and could be transmitted other than by actually being with the people concerned. And then it was changed again, probably even more fundamentally by the introduction of electronic means of communication about two generations ago. And that's such a short time that we really can't see where that's going. Cultural evolution also works by natural selection. That's clear enough. But it is worth pointing out that it's quite different from genetic evolution because there are no cultural species. In other words, there are no cultures that cannot interbreed. And actually, that was something Darwin had quite wrong because he believed that sexual selection would stop races and people's mi mixing. Um, and history has shown that that was um, not a correct prediction. Um, uh, and there is no non-blending inheritance, something which comes out of Mendel, you know, things don't skip generations the way they do in genetic evolution. And therefore, the attempt to produce cultural analogues of genes, the culture genes of Edmund Wilson, or the memes of Richard Dawkins, I have written here, shouldn't be taken too seriously. I was feeling slightly polite when I wrote this. They're actually a load of nonsense. Um, it's perfectly clear that cultural evolution works on groups. It's all about language, it's all about communication. It's completely unreasonable to believe that it could work in any other way than working on groups, um, and indeed it does. The advantage of cultural evolution is that it's much faster, of course. Uh, genetic evolution works at breeding, happens about three or four times a century in man. Um, cultural evolution occurs all the time. It can be disseminated to the ends of the earth now in minutes, and it probably allows greater ranges of behavior than we could uh, imagine being in the genome, and I gave the examples here I've given often before, is how easy would it be to encode genes that would tell you how to fly an airliner or to fit in a tax return or various other implausible things of this description. Disadvantages are, of course, that it's much less firmly fixed in the population. Genetic gains, everybody has, they're in the populations. Uh, cultural evolution is often, uh, was often only held in the hands of the literate minority, which was frequently the priesthood, 
And there are classic examples of how it was lost, one of the most striking being the Mayas in southern Mexico, who when their priesthood was destroyed by the Spaniards, this very sophisticated population returned to an early Stone Age culture until very recently. So one has to be aware of that. Now before going on to discuss religion, I must briefly say something about honeybees, because they've greatly influenced the sociobiologist, and actually me. Um, they are one of the few species other than man that relies on cooperation of individuals doing different tasks, which are not based on anatomical castes. When the honeybee's population is complicated, there is a queen um, who is a fertile female who does nothing actually than laying eggs, plus or minus sperm, though whether she lays an egg or an egg plus a sperm is not decided by the queen, it's decided by the workers. Um, and that gives rise either to diploid females, if there's an egg and a sperm, or a haploid male, uh, which is defended directly from the queen only. And this is a very peculiar method of sex determination which is used by honeybees, but not incidentally by termites. The males mate with a virgin queen on a mating flight, and the workers do everything else, but not all at the same time. Different parts of their lives, they do different things, um, and they do them in different ways. They can either be tidy builders of cells or untidy. They can be aggressive or they can be docile. They can be industrious and in gathering honey or lazy. They can rapidly swarm, or they can be swarming averse, as the deer keepers prefer the latter. And these variations are entirely genetically determined. And every beekeeper knows this because of what is called the requeening experiment. If you don't like the way your colony behaves, which is not infrequent, um, what you do is you introduce a newly mated queen uh, from a better colony, and then the workers that grow up in the hive learn nothing from the bad workers they grow up among. They behave entirely according to their genetic inheritance. And this clearly involves group selection also shows that bees do not have free will, and I will therefore argue that bees don't need religion. Whether they have it or not, of course, I don't know. Um, bee altruism is at the basis of sociobiology, and is based, as I will point out to you, on a whole series of misconceptions. Hamilton and his pupil, Richard Dawkins, believe that bees die after a stinging an insect uh, when, which attacks their hives. This is the kamikaze bee that Dawkins made famous in the um, selfish gene. Um, and that this altruism explained by the fact that they're 75% genetically identical with their sisters because of this curious method of sex determination. This gave rise to this idea of kin selection, which gave rise to the selfish gene. Actually, it's all nonsense. Um, bees don't die when they sting other insects. Bees die when they sting elastic-skinned mammals like us because they have an arrow-shaped sting and they can't get it out. And therefore, uh, they pull out their hind guts and die. All bad beekeepers, such as me, who have had fighting around their hives and who look at the dead bees can see that they haven't died from stinging. They've died from being stung because their hind guts are not sticking out. Um, so uh, stinging humans is of no evolutionary significance to bees who have been alive out for very much longer than humans. Um, and therefore, they do not commit suicide when they defend their hive against other insects. Um, termites, which don't have haploid males, have a very similar behavior. And the other great illusion is this idea that the Virgin Queen, when she mates, mates only with one drone, the fastest flying, a perfect example of um, sexual selection. In fact, once one had cameras which could actually take pictures of the event, the Virgin Queen behaves like the Whore of Babylon and mates with every, every drone in sight. And possibly, actually, most of the sperm are left by the last drone, which perhaps is not what evolutionary speculation might have suggested. So one can really forget about a great deal of this. But it was on the basis of this that group selection was rejected in the 1960s, largely by Edmund Wilson. But Edmund Wilson, together with David Sloan Wilson, who was always, I think, on the other side, has in fact had a Wittgensteinian conversion on this point. And in a much more recent publication, uh, they've come to the conclusion that this was evolution's wrong turn in the 60s. And the group selection does take place, and selfishness beats altruism within groups. Altruistic groups beat selfish groups, and everything else is commentary. That's a direct quotation. Um, it's not clear that others, for example, Richard Dawkins, have yet accepted this Wittgensteinian conversion, but Edmund Wilson, who started it all, certainly has. So he no longer rejects this. 